Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am Lee Donaldson, Sr., the founder and chief servant of Bethel Temple Cathedral of Agape Christian Ministries International of New Bedford, Massachusetts, the home of Frederick Douglass. We're delighted that you've tuned into our Bible study session, the Church Family Ministry Plan and Training of the Leaders, Leaders Discipling Leaders by Craig Castor of Family Discipleship Ministries. Before we go any further, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we hallow your holy name and give you all of the praise. We thank you for your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and for the forgiveness of our sins. Heavenly Father, we ask now that you would enlighten the eyes of our hearts, that we may know the hope of our calling, and give us wisdom and revelation to know you better through the fellowship of your only begotten Son, let your word and wisdom dwell in us through this study and strengthen us in our walk as we endeavor to serve and do your will through our life in this present world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Welcome to Family Ministry Discipleship Plan. This outline has been written for the purpose of edifying the Christian church in the elements of the different components of family ministry. We have made some basic assumptions in preparing this material, such as most Christian churches are now performing some of the basic functions of family ministry that include premarital counseling, annual marriage retreats, men's and or women's ministry Bible study, small group home fellowship, and youth ministry. Our hope is that you will find this information helpful for enhancing discipleship in your church leaders and in your flock in God's will for the family. First, let's talk about discipleship. Many Christian churches today have properly prioritized evangelism and evangelistic events as part of their core purpose. Unfortunately, most are not emphasizing discipleship, especially when it comes to marriage and parenting. Statistics tell us half of the over 1,200,000 divorces each year in the United States proclaim to be believers. Also, over 70% of our children being raised in Christian homes after 10 plus years of youth groups and or Christian schools are walking away from their faith after leaving home. Just these two statistics alone should stir our hearts to examine our ways in the area of family ministry. While the object of evangelism is salvation, the object of discipleship is the development of an intimate abiding relationship with Jesus Christ to grow in spiritual maturity and learning how to tend to the things God has given to us according to his word. The most powerful and effective evangelism will result in naturally when mature Christians whose lives within their homes, in the church, workplaces, and communities reflect and glorify the true and living God as a result of their abiding relationship in Jesus Christ and following his word. One of the primary purposes of the Christian church is to identify and exercise the gifts of mature Christians in our church for the benefit of discipling others. Many Christians believe that being discipled means going through a six or eight week class to learn the basics of Christianity and hopefully the importance of having and maintaining a daily abiding relationship with Jesus. 
This type of class is very important, but being disciple means more than knowing the fundamentals of being a Christian. Being disciple means you are being taught in the ways of the Lord in all areas of life. The flows chart with this DVD series will help you get a better visual understanding of the many opportunities the church has in discipling people in marriage and parenting. Next, let's talk about family ministry discipleship plan description. Why provide discipleship focused family ministry? Since we believe that God created the family, Genesis 1, 28, and Genesis 2, verses 18 through 24, then we must also believe he has some very important instructions for us to follow regarding how to live as a family and also how to tend to our families. Over 90% of the body of Christ today do not have a godly example from their parents. If we believe God has given us his instructions for the family in the Bible, Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20, and it is by these instructions we are to tend to the needs of his children. John 21 verses 15 and 17. Then who or what organization did God create to disciple people in the ways of God? The church. Does effective ministry just happen? No. There must be a vision. Proverbs 29, 18. Or else busyness confusion, and less important things will monopolize the attention of the ministers. God does not want confusion in church activities, 1 Corinthians 14 and 33. He wants us to prayerfully and carefully consider his word and his will for leading and setting the vision for church ministries. Since he has provided direction in his word for church ministry, we should not become distracted by each wave that breaks into our shore. If we are to fulfill his calling for ministry in our church, there must be leadership, vision, strategic planning, and practical implementation. If we are to lead, we must first be walking in his instructions and power in order to guide others along the way. We must go in advance of the people we intend to lead. Therefore, we exhort you to first train the leaders in the ways of the Lord for family ministry. There are many in church leadership positions that did not have a godly example given to them by their own parents and have never been trained or discipled in marriage and parenting. Now, let's look at opportunity one, leadership training. Why is this first? Because a pastor or lay minister cannot lead other people unless their lives are following God's will and ways in their own families. Timothy 2, 7 and 1 Timothy 3 verses 4 through 12 are not suggestions and there are serious consequences to the body if their homes are not in order. If the pastor already has leadership in the church, staff or lay members, he should start by discipling these people through marriage and parenting before the rest of the body. It is also important to follow up to ensure they are applying these principles in their home. Because many Christians, even those in church leadership positions, do not truly believe there are consequences when they compromise God's instructions in fulfilling their role as a husband, wife, or parent. A pastor needs to be very clear that these instructions are not just suggestions. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way you should go. Oh, that you had heeded my commandments, then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Your descendants also would have been like the sand, and the offspring of your body like the grains of sand. His name would not have been cut off nor destroyed from before me. Isaiah 48, verses 17 through 19. God so wants to bless us, our families, and our churches, but we must choose to obey his word. It is not sacrificing ourselves or our families 
that make us better ministers for Christ. It's doing the will of God in our life. 1 Samuel 15, verses 22 and 23. God even gives pastors warning not to be flippant or irresponsible about putting people in leadership positions. 1 Timothy 3, verse 5. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? And in 1 Timothy 3.10, he says, But let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. First be tested means a season of faithful obedience, intending to and fulfilling the will of God in these specific areas. The pastor has the authority and has been charged by God to disciple his leadership. Those sheep whom the Lord has given unique gifts to edify the body must first be discipled and given a season to implement and walk in obedience. It is so important that the pastor exhorts his leadership to see these instructions as priorities that need to be implemented in their life, not just suggestions. Our obedience, or lack of, has a significant effect upon the ministry God has called us to do. Proverbs 13, 13. He who despises the word will be destroyed, but he who fears the commandment will be rewarded. It is common for pastors to meet with some opposition when they begin doing this with their leadership. Some feel threatened and others feel it is unnecessary because they feel or believe that they don't need any help in these areas. As a pastor, however, reassure them that the reason why you are doing this is 1 Timothy 3 verses 1 through 12 and Titus 2, 7. As leaders, their very lives are affecting the body of Christ and when they have an opportunity to give advice disciple or counsel someone as the pastor, you want to make sure that they are giving the word and not their own opinion. When new people wish to become involved in church leadership, either the pastor or another leader, he designates should disciple these people through the material and allow a season for implementation in their home before bringing them on as part of the church leadership. If they are not married or do not have children, maybe a music leader or youth pastor, they still need to be disciples so they know the will of God in these areas. Today, much of the church's approach in this area is reactionary after the crisis has occurred. Ideally, discipleship is more about prevention, not intervention. Many pastors today have never been discipled themselves so they are unclear about the full meaning of discipling someone according to the pattern of the Lord. It is not just giving people a book to read and then randomly meeting with them to ask them what they learn, nor is it just having them come to a class setting and going through a video series. Discipling others means you are teaching them step by step, setting goals, and identifying the areas that need to change with a level of accountability. This is why in all of our materials, there is not only workbooks that accompany the DVD series, but there is also homework that involves helping you to accomplish these tasks. The importance of a pastor doing this with his leadership is he is not only following the example Jesus demonstrated in discipling the apostles, he is also teaching them how to disciple others. Now, let's look at opportunity two. Marriage classes. Use the Marriage is a Ministry seven week DVD series, which includes a small group leader's guide, workbook, and a personal devotional workbook. We suggest offering quarterly classes so people can plug in easily without waiting until they find themselves in the midst of a crisis. They can be done in a home setting or church setting. These classes are great for premarital couples as well as seasoned veterans. Keep in mind and be in prayer about raising up marriage mentors 
who can come alongside those couples who are really struggling with breaking the old sinful habits and developing those new godly ones. It is good also to be praying about raising up others who can lead the class so the same persons are not overburdened. Now let's look at opportunity three, parenting classes. Use the Parenting is a Ministry nine week audio or DVD series. Offer quarterly classes for all families to attend rather traditional blended or single parents. They can be done in home or church settings. You can also include this material as part of premarital counseling for blended family couples. Pray and seek the Lord's guidance for raising up parent mentors to help teach and disciple others as a class leader or one-on-one -on -one discipler. Now let's look at opportunity four, counseling. When people come in for counseling, this is one of the best opportunities we have to disciple them in the particular area in which they are seeking help. What is discipleship focused counseling? It is helping the person being counseled to understand why and how the situation exists in their life. Training, discipling them in the biblical ways of dealing with the problem, helping them learn how to live their life in a particular area, marriage or parenting, as the Word of God instructs. Discipleship focused counseling focuses on the root of the problem instead of temporarily treating the symptoms. Pray and seek the Lord's guidance for raising up counselors with the, the spiritual gifts to help disciple others in the area of marriage and parenting. Counselors must be equipped to disciple those that are in need of counsel in these areas and not just dealing with the particular problems at hand. Good counseling has three elements. First, bring understanding to the origin of the problem, sin, hurt, or ignorance. Secondly, identify the fruits stemming from the problem, behaviors, wrong thinking, bad habits, or etc. And then thirdly, disciple them using God's word as the antidote to both deal with the origin of the problem and the training up to the correct way of thinking and living. This includes marriage and parenting training. Now let's look at opportunity five, baby dedications. We are asking God to bless this child and family, but also it is a public acknowledgement of dedicating this child unto the Lord, Proverbs 22, 6. The whole premise of dedicating this child unto the Lord is a commitment to raise this child up as the Lord instructs in his word. We, the church, must take this public dedication seriously. And if we do, we will first investigate if the parents have ever been trained up, discipled in the way God desires this child to be raised. If parents have never received any training in this area, or you are unfamiliar with the training they did receive, the church can make it a requirement to complete the parenting is a ministry. The first appointment is to explain what a baby dedication is all about and why is it important to be trained up, discipled in how to raise your child as unto the Lord. You can refer to them one of the parenting classes or meet one-on-one. -on -one. I strongly encourage you to not just give them the video series and have them go through it. If they cannot join the class, then it is important to meet with them after they have completed each session in the DVD series. Now we're to opportunity six, youth ministries. The youth pastor position gives him important insight into the lives of the families he is pastoring. It is important to establish communication between the youth pastor, the family pastor, and the senior pastor to discuss the problems or the conditions of the families within the church. This will help you strategize how you can best reach out to those families who are struggling in the parenting or marriage areas. This is why it's important to train youth pastors and assistants in God's plan in raising children. Youth pastors need this training in order to effectively minister to their youth and identify the possible problems that may be happening within the home. 
It is also common for parents to call or meet with the youth pastor for help and or advice in raising their children. The youth pastors have many opportunities to encourage and exhort the youth in God's plan for authority and submitting to their parents' discipline. If they are not trained in this, they may be given indirect or incorrect counsel. Many parents will attend a two-hour training if offered in how to disciple their own children. Today, less than 10% of Christian parents have a regular Bible study in their homes, and the main reason why it is is that they have never been trained how. Teaching parents how to implement an ongoing Bible study with their children and providing age-appropriate material is vital to us changing the tide of so many of our children walking away from their faith when they leave our homes. Youth mentor mentoring and discipleship. There are many single parent families in society today and youth with non-Christian parents. This is the primary purpose for a youth mentoring and discipleship program. This is a great opportunity to share the love of Christ with the child that has little or no relationship with their absentee father or mother, James 1, 27. Pray and seek the Lord's guidance for raising up a coordinator for the youth mentoring program with the spiritual gifts to help disciple others in the area of youth mentoring according to God's word. Discipleship training. The great commission given to us by Jesus Christ is go therefore and make disciples, Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Yet today, if you walked up and asked Christians if they are a disciple, many would respond with, what do you mean? Most Christians believe that being disciple is attending a six week class on what it means to be a Christian. Although this is important, it falls very short of what Jesus meant when he exhorted the church to go and make disciples. Jesus, the best teacher there ever was and will be, spent three years pouring himself into 12 men and we think we can do this in six weeks. We need to teach Christians what it means to answer the call of being a disciple of Christ, how to come alongside other believers and teach them how to have an intimate relationship with Jesus. What we believe as Christians, and also, if married or have children, how to fulfill God's will in these areas. Titus 2, 1 through 10, exhorts the older mature Christian to disciple the younger baby Christians in these things. Not only do we need to teach them how to disciple, but also what to disciple, providing good biblical tools to equip the disciples to help them to be more effective and strategic in discipling others is very important. This also helps the pastor to ensure consistency of what is being taught. Now, how do we begin? First, pray. It is very clear by both the conditions of many of our families within the body of Christ and the blindness and apathy toward this crisis that Satan has and is at work here. We must bind the enemy by praying for the hurting families, praying for God to raise up leaders in this area, and praying for God's protection as you move forward in your family ministry. Two, start with your leadership, not only getting them to pray along with you, but also schedule their training in both marriage and parenting as your first priority. First Timothy 3 tells us if their homes are not in order, then their ministry will be weak. I strongly suggest the senior pastor disciple the staff personally in both of these areas. Third, raise up either a pastor or lay member to oversee the ongoing marriage and parenting ministries. Set a vision and strategy to reach the families in your church with the materials. Regular exhortation from the pastor in these areas to the people is critical, along with a planned strategy. And then fourth, additional training for those 
who are called to counsel may be needed for both marriage or parenting issues. I pray that this information has blessed and encouraged you. Please let us know if we can help you in ministering to the families within your church. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. Welcome to Training Our Leaders, Discipling Other Leaders. Leaders, we have given you the tools necessary to lead a small group in both the Parenting is a Ministry and Marriage is a Ministry video series. The Leader's Guide helps you to facilitate the group in such a way that discipleship can take place and people's lives be transformed. That is the goal of each series, teaching God's people how to tend to their families according to his word. This is an important part of the fulfillment of Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. In this scripture is the imperative verb to make disciples. This means that making disciples is a continual process of one person growing in biblical knowledge and principles, obeying the truth, and then passing it on to others, that is discipleship. This was Christ's expectation and vision. First, a leader is to have this type of mindset when leading a small group, encouraging the participants to share with someone else. God has not called us to be calisacs, but thoroughfares, passing what we know on to others. Secondly, a leader should have the same vision for cultivating other leaders to lead other small groups. This is also part of discipleship. This biblical standard in leadership comes from Paul's exhortation to Timothy. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Please notice the progression Paul taught Timothy. And Tim Timothy was to commit or teach what was given to him by Paul to faithful men and then the faithful men were to teach others. As a leader, we have a responsibility to train other leaders in how to lead a small group of their own. The only way this can happen is if you have a plan to carry out the vision. Now, let's look at some suggestions for leaders mentoring other leaders. It would be ideal for you and your wife to first go through the material so that you have had a chance to apply it in your own lives and to become familiar with the handouts and how they are to be implemented in the small group setting. Then lead a small group. Since you are going to disciple another leader or leaders from that small group, you could even have another couple co-lead the small group with you. Then both of you as leaders could start another group after you have finished the first one. Now, let's look at some fundamental issues. First, pray. This may seem obvious, but many times this component gets left out. Ask God to bring someone that you can disciple or mentor and train to lead a small group on their own. Second, look for faithful men. You are looking for those who are faithful in their family, at church, in their commitments, and serving others. It is important to be thinking about this before you start your small group. Since you are dealing with either parenting or marriage, you are looking for a couple that have a strong relationship with God and with each other. The man would be leading the group and the wife could be a supporting role. Remember, you are not looking for perfection, but couples who are heading in the right direction desiring to learn 
and pressing in to work out these principles. They also need to see the value and importance of teaching these truths and are motivated and excited about the class. Third, prepare. In the same way you prepare to lead the small group, you also need to prepare to teach and disciple a leader. This may be unfamiliar territory for you since most leaders have not been discipled themselves. The best way to do this is, one, after you have prepared to lead the group, sit down with the other leader or leaders and discuss what you are going to cover in the next lesson. Explain how you are going to lead the group through the material that has been provided in the leader's guide. Second, encourage them to write down any questions that they may think of during the group lesson. And then third, meet with them after each session to discuss the class and answer any questions they may have. You might also come up with a list of questions that the Lord has laid on your heart to ask them after the teaching session. And then fourth, time. Discipleship takes time. You and the one you are training must set time aside to meet before and even after teaching the session to answer questions, discuss the class, and to pray. You can also use this time to encourage each other in implementing the biblical principles in your own family. Accountability is key to success. And then fifthly, example. The best way to disciple someone to lead a small group is for them to watch you lead the group. A, Timothy had firsthand experience with watching Paul and how he taught, handled people, answered questions, took time with people, discussed scripture, and how Paul was an example to other believers. B, even though each group will have its own dynamics with personalities, maturity, intellectual capabilities, and personal problems that may surface, you as a leader will be able to train the other leader in how to handle these issues by your example and your discipleship times that you have set aside. C, I do not suggest you just hand the material over to a couple and say, follow the leader's guide, and if you have any questions, just ask me. If you are perfectly assured they are mature enough to do it, even then your oversight, involvement, experience, and knowledge should be passed down to the other leader. And then six, ongoing discipleship. I would suggest that you would be available and have planned meetings with the leader you have disciple after he has started a small group of his own. It is not a bad idea to sit in on the first couple of lessons to be a support to him. But remember, he is the one directing the class. Maybe take notes. So if you see something he could do better, so you can suggest what he can do to help the next class. For instance, if you see that one parent dominates the class, you can suggest how to deal with that issue in a gentle way. You will notice as you read the book of Acts that Paul went back to the churches he established to disciple them a second time. He was showing his support, encouraging them, and helping strengthen them in the areas that they might have been weak. Praise the Lord that he has laid it on your heart to disciple families. As you pursue to duplicate yourself into other leaders, may the Lord richly bless you as you carry out the discipleship making process. God has promised to give you wisdom if you like it. All you have to do is ask him, James 1, verses 5 through 8. If you have any questions, please contact us at www.agapecmi.org. Now I would like to share some periodicals that I found to be quite informative and helpful. The first one being How Leaders Developed by John C. Maxwell. Leadership has to be nurtured, and it's not always something someone's born with, but something they acquire. Leadership is not an exclusive club reserved for those who were born with it. The traits compri comprising the raw material of leadership can be acquired. Link them up with desire 
and nothing can keep you from becoming a leader. Some people have a more intuitive grasp of how to lead than others. These natural born leaders will always emerge, but their influence hinges upon their ability to supplement inborn talent with learned skills. Ultimately, leadership is developed, not discovered. Now let's look at some three E's of leadership development. The first one being environment. People accustom themselves to their environment and take clues from their surroundings. In the 1980s, social scientists came up with the broken window theory, which indicated that the physical appearance of a community affects its crime rate. Rundown properties, widespread graffiti, and trash thrown about in a neighborhood invites crime by signaling that no one is watching and that no one cares what happens. Oppositely, a clean and well-kept neighborhood gives the impression that people are monitoring their community and willing to take action to ensure its safety. Every organization is permitted by an invisible culture which communicates an unspoken message that shapes its people. As has often been said, leadership is more caught than taught. Be attentive to the influence of the following five elements of your organizational environment. Habits of social interaction, physical design and declaration, morale, that is emotional tone, level of intellectual stimulation, and spiritual well-being. Two, the second E, equipping. Equipping begins with expectations, namely that leadership is influence, that leadership can be learned, and that leaders can multiply their influence by equipping others. Equipping succeeds with training. Telling is not teaching, and listening is not learning. We learn to do by doing. Training must be interactive. Equipping continues with teaching. The reward of a teacher is a changed life. Success comes through achievement, but significance results from helping others to grow. Practically speaking, the equipping process can be broken into five steps. First, say it, that is, explain the task. Second, show it, this demonstrate how to perform the task. Third, assign it, let the other person attempt the task. Fourth, study it, observe how the person performed the task. And finally, assess it offer feedback based on the person's performance. Now we're to the third E, exposure. A little exposure trumps a lot of theory. To develop leaders, expose your people to expert practitioners. These real world educators model how to lead. They set a living example which serves as a source of inspiration. Whereas equipping delivers job specific training, Exposure provides a vision or picture of what successful leadership looks like. The next periodical is How to Connect with People by Dr. Tim Elmore. Many leaders make the mistake of separating leadership from relationships. It used to be that IQ was more important than EQ to leaders. In other words, the person with the highest IQ got to be the leader. Today, it's now more about EQ than IQ, our emotional intelligence, or the way we manage our emotions and the emotions of others are key to connecting with and leading teams. Consider this, success in school is about 75% IQ and 25% EQ. Once you enter your career, however, it's just the opposite. Good leaders cultivate good people skills. Emotional intelligence is the sum total of four ingredients. The first one, my self-awareness. The second one, my self-management. The third, my social awareness. And my fourth, my relationship management. So how do leaders connect with people? 
Many leaders make the mistake of separating leadership from relationships. This happens when a person steps into a position of leadership and assumes that everyone will follow them because of their position. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Now let's look at four word pictures. The first analogy is the analogy of the host. Take initiative and make them feel comfortable. Every interaction has a host and guest. Good leaders host the relationships on their team. Knowing what a good host does in their home, we ought to be able to do it with people everywhere. Leaders set the tone and create safe environments to grow. The next analogy is the analogy of the doctor. Ask questions. Probe and poke until you see a need. Doctors ask questions before they give answers. As you attempt to dis discern people's needs or team problems, ask questions until you can see where they are. Only then do you try to address their needs. Don't give a prescription before a diagnosis. The third analogy is the analogy of the counselor. Become an active listener and discern what you hear. Just like a good counselor, your verbal and nonverbal skills communicate your understanding. Leaders must be active leaders. They realize listening motivates faster than great speeches. We earn our right to speak by listening. And then the fourth analogy is the analogy of the tour guide. Don't merely travel with them, but get them to their destination. Leaders are not travel agents who merely tell people about a destination. A leader's people skills must result in their ability to take people to a destination. Our purpose isn't to be liked by people, but to take them on a journey and to reach a goal. Now let's talk about leading difficult people. Every leader is going to face difficult people and draining positions. Every teacher can say the same thing about their classrooms. Even more, almost every parent will face the same dilemma in their home. They will have kids who drain them because they are so much alike or because they are so difficult. The adult reaches the end of their rope and has no strategy to deal with the child. These difficulties are common to leaders, teachers, and parents. Let me suggest a strategy for each difficult student and what I've found to be a healthy strategy to lead them. First, let's look at the types. The first one being the Sherman tank, rides over people. Second is the space cadet, lives in another world. Third is the volcano, explosive, unpredictable. Fourth is the thumb sucker, self-pity and pouts. The fifth is the wet blanket, always down. The sixth is the garbage collector, attracts the worst. The seventh is the user, demands much time and energy. Now let's look at the strategy. First, consider the issue, stand up if important. Second, find and develop their unique skills. Third, remove from crowd, listen, be direct. Fourth, don't reward. Show them how to deal with trouble. Fifth, be honest. Don't cater or let them lead. Six, challenge their statements. Fourth, honesty. And seventh, set boundaries. Require accountability. Now, there are 10 truths every leader should know about people. Throughout my career, I have learned people's skills from some of my mentors and the following are a list of 10 realities that I use as reminders of the basic need my team members have. First, people are often insecure. Give them confidence. Second, people like to feel special. Honor them. Third, people look for a better tomorrow. Give them hope. Fourth, people need to be understood. Listen to them. Fifth, people like direction. Navigate for them. Six, people are needy. Speak to their needs first. Seventh, 
people get emotionally low. Encourage them. Eight, people want to associate with success. Help them win. Nine, people desire good relationships. Build community on your team. And 10, people seek models to follow. Set the example for them. Now I have two questions for reflection. The first one being, are you a natural people person? Why do you believe this? And second, what's the most challenging type of person for you to lead? And how do you do it? Now our last periodical is Leading Across from Competing to Completing by John C. Maxwell. How can you avoid the negative consequences of competition and still use it to fuel success and innovation? Leading peers can be tricky since you're spontaneously cooperating with and competing against them. For example, Athletes on the same team contend for a limited number of positions in the starting lineup, yet compete together on game day. Musicians within an orchestra by way for the first chair, but then harmonize their talent to the delight audiences with their music. Coworkers jockey for prestigious assignments, but afterwards combine their skills to advance the mission of the organization. Healthy work environments depend on competition and cooperation. Both are necessary in order to win. Either too much competition or a deficiency of it can damage team dynamics. In an overly competitive work culture, the natural antagonism of competition turns teammates into enemies and deter cooperation. Conversely, in an environment absent of competition, the aversion to conflict snuffs out critical thinking. Conversely, in our environment absent of competition, the aversion to conflict snuffs out critical thinking and stifles initiative. Arriving at suitable levels of competitiveness at work begins by acknowledging that competition has benefits and drawbacks. Now let's examine the upside of competition. Competition provides feedback. Until we match our skills against a competitor, we seldom know the extent of our strengths and weaknesses. Secondly, competition calls forth our best efforts. Runners don't set world records in practice. They break them when racing against uh, other elite athletes. Now, let's look at the downside of competition. Competition can become personal. We use the phrase friendly competition, but oftentimes competition is anything but friendly and ends up fueling personal animosities. Secondly, competition can warp our view of success and failure. In a culture obsessed with winning, we can be tempted to measure our self-worth by the outcome of competition. Now let's examine completing instead of competing. To have the most influence with your peers, put completing fellow leaders ahead of competing against them. Endeavor to make your teammates better instead of trying to prove that you're the best. If you spend time adding value to peers, you'll eventually become very valuable to them. The following tips will aid you in adopting a healthy perspective on competition in the workplace. Switch your standard of comparison. We tend to compare ourselves to other people when we should compare ourselves to our potential. I'm not in competition with anybody but myself. My goal is to beat my last performance, Celine Dion. Reevaluate your definition of success and failure. First, resist the temptation to define yourself by wins and losses. We can only control the effort we put in, not the outcome we experience. Second, move from an individual to collective notion of accomplishment. Rather than being solely preoccupied with personal advancement, learn to see success as helping others to victory. Success is peace of mind which is a direct result of self-satisfaction and knowing you made the effort 
to become the best that you are capable of becoming. John Wooten. You will accomplish more in the next two months developing a sincere interest in two people than you will accomplish in the next two months trying to get two people interested in you. Tim Sanders. Next, adopt an abundance mindset. There are many lanes on the highway to success. Search for win-win partnerships with fellow coworkers in which you both stand to gain something valuable. Sharing resources or lending assistance to others enriches rather than impoverishes you. The more we develop an abundance mentality, the more we are genuinely happy for the successes, well-being, achievements, recognition, and good fortune of other people. We believe their success adds to rather than distracts from our lives. Stephen Covey. This concludes our study on the church family ministry plan and training of the leaders, leaders discipling leaders by Craig Castor of Family Discipleship Ministries. It is our prayer that this presentation will strengthen and encourage you as you endeavor to live your life for Christ, serving him in the world according to his command. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. Jesus is alive.